What's up, you lazy, entitled, basement-dwelling millennials, bootstrapping boomers, apathetic Xers, and goddamn Gen Z kids today? We are super excited. Uh, we have a guest with us today who um, I'm pretty personally invested in because she is running to represent me uh, in our district, uh, Minnesota 8th. Um, she drove all the way down here from Duluth to be in the studio with us today. Her name is Jen Schultz, and she is running against our ever so lovely current representative, Pete Stauber. Um, so, uh, uh, Jen, we got the opportunity to meet at the Mon uh, Humphrey Mondale dinner a few weeks ago, and that was a, a really cool experience. And I appreciate you taking the time to come to our little um, measly podcast here and, and uh, tell us about yourself and um, what hopefully you'll be able to uh, to do for us here in the state of Minnesota and the country and, uh, and, and go from there. So I guess we should just start with introductions. Um, tell us about yourself, tell our audience, uh, you know, who you are, which office you're running for, why you're running for it. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting <laughs> me to be here. I heard of, uh, this podcast from a insider DFL person <laughs> in Minnesota. It's like, you have to go on this podcast with Jordan and Taylor. And I'm like, tell me more about it. So I'm glad to be here. Not a big deal driving down, but again, my name's Jen Schultz. I'm running for U.S. Congress in Minnesota's 8th District. The 8th District is about the size of the state of West Virginia. So it's yeah, really it's large. Huge. And if you're familiar with Minnesota, it goes all the way up to the bump out north by Canada, Lake mm -hmm. of the Woods. Comes down, includes Bemidji area, Brainerd Lakes, the whole arrowhead, you know, Duluth, mm -hmm. the North Shore of Lake Superior, and then comes all the way south to the to the just north of Stillwater, has two precincts in Stillwater. So wow. it includes Hugo, Forest Lake, Chisago, Lindstrom. It's very large. And so when I ran in 2022, I put just myself and mm -hmm. the staff person, we put on over 30,000 miles in just a few months. Wow, I was going to ask how many miles you've been putting <laughs> yeah. on doing this. Yeah, a lot of miles, <laughs> but we want to be everywhere because oh. we want to listen to everyone across the district, especially in the smallest communities that I'm sure a lot of people have felt really neglected by both political parties. Absolutely. So it was really a listening tour that we're doing, and I think I've already probably reached 30,000 miles for this election so far. Well, that's incredible. And I mean, and I, I can obviously uh, uh, speak on, on behalf of you you doing that and being genuine about it because you're here, and we are uh, we film in Pine City, uh, record in Pine City here, um, which is, I, I'd say, one of those areas that feels a little neglected when it comes to, you know, representation and whatnot. It's it's a rural community, and you were willing to make the drive. It's about uh, about 80 miles, I suppose, 80, 90 miles for you to come down here today for this. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely, uh, from from my experience so far, willing to, to put in the effort to get here um, personally in front of people. Because we offered, uh, we gave Jen uh, a full opportunity to do this remotely. Um, and she, uh, had absolutely no hesitation about coming in here and doing it with us. So, um, we're really excited, uh, to have you here. I'm really excited because I think, um, this is probably, uh, the biggest opportunity I've had to influence something that affects me personally. Uh, if, if we get you a couple more votes from something like this and, and, and we get to flip this district, you know, um, I, I could be able to say that I, I did something to contribute to that, and I'm really excited for that. So thank you so much again uh, for being here. Um, what, are you, what about you, Taylor? Yeah, I've kind of been just uh, running all over you. Yeah, here. Uh, I'm just your, your lowly Minneapolis light uh, um, person to make my way up here. Uh, I don't have as much at stake, obviously, um, but I am also very excited to have somebody like yourself who, um, you know, a state representative, um, which is really cool. We'd love to have anybody mm -hmm. from our state um, Congress uh, you know, on the show, much less somebody running for, um, you know, federal Congress. So uh, that's really cool for me. Um, and uh, I have done, I've obviously did some pre-research and I, I thought mm -hmm. you, um, you know, you speak very well and you have a lot of good ideas. And so um, I'm excited to talk about some of that. Yeah. And you, you do still have some at stake because you think about this. If she does win, that's one more vote in Congress no, at the right. federal level, which is, I mean, that's a big deal. Like, obviously, that it would absolutely be... is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. Um, and that's huge, especially since right now the, the margins are razor thin in, in the House and uh, and the Senate. I mean, and the Senate. It's, it's, they're both really uh -huh. close right now. And it's it's definitely uneasy going into an election year on how that that could sway. But uh, there's reasons to be hopeful. And, and people like Jen here is one of those reasons to be hopeful. So. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, what What are some of the things that? Uh, well, let's. First of all, we were talking a little bit before, and I found out you're a professor of economics. Um, you teach at UMD. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that, and and specifically uh, where your area of expertise is in economics. Sure. So I am a professor at UMD, and I do teach economics, and my area of expertise is healthcare policy. So I was getting a graduate degree in straight economics, decided I wanted to learn more about healthcare, and as you know, healthcare is very complicated. It is incredible. So I had to spend a few more years learning all about the healthcare industry so I could understand how we could fix it because it it is very broken. Um, And I've been working on that for many, many years, and it was one of the reasons why I ran for the state legislature back Mm -hmm. in 2014 is to work on healthcare reform at the state level because there just wasn't a lot happening um, at the federal level, they wanted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and I knew that Minnesota needed affordable health care, and it was one of the top issues that I ran on that I heard about in my community. So I love working with young people, and mm-hmm. the students keep me young, <laughs> and uh, so I, I know the greatest bands and where to go and, <laughs> and the lingo and what things acronyms mean on social media. Um, so I'm very tuned in, hopefully, to your audience, but... Um, uh, I have really enjoyed teaching. It's one of the most rewarding things I've done. And then I became a state legislator, and that was even more rewarding because I could really impact people's lives in Minnesota. And running for Congress, never thought it was never on my bucket list. Mm-hmm. But no one in 2022 would step up to challenge our current congressmen and because they were afraid they would lose. I mean, no. we, we tried to recruit people, and I'm just like, well, we have to hold him accountable. Mm-hmm. And people were really, really upset because we had a history in the 8th District of having really strong representation from folks like um, former congressman, the late Jim Oberstar, mm-hmm. um, John Blotnick, Rick Nolan, where they were very powerful chairs of committees, the Transportation Committee, Oberstar, they brought billions of dollars back to our state and our country and fixed our roads and bridges and really Mm -hmm. invested in infrastructure. And we didn't have that anymore. So our current congressman, Stauber, Pete Stauber, he's been in office for five years, and he's only passed two bills. And so he's been a big disappointment. I, he named a post office and he created a task force. And then he's I mean, it's important him. stuff that he's doing. You know, post offices need names. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not saying that's not <laughs> bad. That's not bad. But um, and he's sarcasm. not a bad person. I mean, I worked with him when he was a county commissioner. And he's just not a very good representative. Yeah. And that's what people are really upset about. Mm. Um, and he doesn't show up. So like you said, I show up like yep. I showed up here. And that's part of your job is to show up and have public town halls, which he hasn't had any, um, and then vote your district, vote for what the majority of people want. And he's been a big disappointment on that. Yeah, I I could not agree more. And like, obviously, I've met you now and uh, you've taken time for... us and I'm I'm a constituent. I've never I couldn't even tell you what he looked like if you showed me a picture of him. That's uh Didn't you watch the video I sent you yesterday? Uh I did not. Oh my gosh. I was I was going to and then <laughs> ADD happened and I forgot. Um I sent yeah. him your uh your 2022 debate with with Pete. Mm. Those were fun. Those were fun <laughs> debates and no one thought he would debate me what we had uh three debates towards the end of the campaign in 2022 and um, but not a lot of people watched them. Not a lot of people showed up. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the the video I think I found had maybe like a couple thousand views, mm-hmm. and it was like two years old. Obviously, um, it was the W D I O or W. Yeah, it was the so on the news station, yeah. and so that was the first one. So I, honestly, I was really nervous. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I could tell a little bit, but mm-hmm. I still thought that you you came out ahead on that. I was like. There's there's nothing out of of substance that that Pete is saying at all. There, it was the the you know, classic uh, right wing lines just repeated over mm-hmm. and over again, um, which was kind of disappointing for a debate. But like, <laughs> um, no, I I thought you did really good, and that was honestly it's kind of the only like recent thing I could find of you on online, which is totally fine as far as like in video content. She um, did just start a TikTok channel now. Okay. She did, and we were at the um, St. Patrick's Day Parade in mm-hmm. Cross Lake. And this is the biggest parade we've walked in. We've walked in a lot of parades because it's two miles. A lot of people. Mm. And a lot of people were having a lot of lot of fun. And mm-hmm. we got a very warm welcome. And I was dancing to saw, Dessa. Uh-huh. Yeah, the bullpen. That's kind of our wow. song. And um, people loved the song. 
and everyone was dancing along the parade route. They didn't know if we were Democrats or Republicans, no. but no. they were happy we were there. It's a cool and vibe they were, for they, sure. They were it very is. supportive. And and you know, honestly, um, also guys, follow her on TikTok. Uh, Jen Schultz is it just at Jen Schultz? Um, do you know? I think it's at Rep Jen Schultz. Uh, my Rep. Twitter is at Rep Jen Schultz. Um, Jen Schultz for Congress is yeah. my Facebook, but yes, um, TikTok. Yeah, f- follow her on all the socials. Make sure that you you get behind her there. Um, obviously, every every follow she gets helps get her in front of more eyes. Uh, and more people, and um, that that can make a big difference. But uh, I think I, I think our supporters will be mm-hmm. supportive of you, and certainly supportive of your agenda. So um, hopefully, get a little bit of a bump with this. Yeah, and, I, um, a little bit of publicity at least. Yeah, That's... we'll do more videos. I'm excited to do more videos. Uh, no, <laughs> not I, just me dancing to mm-hmm. a song, but um, sure. videos but, but, of debate. Sorry, what I was what I was going to say on that is when you said that you, they didn't know if you're Democrat or Republican, and I think that that is is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, um. People still prioritize uh, personal connection over party. Like even when when you get right down to it, and obviously personal connection at a federal level, even for Congress is hard, but you know, like you start getting Senate and and president, you're you're probably never going to shake hands with uh, those people specifically, but you're, uh, it's wearing out shoe leather, right? That that that's getting in front of people and shaking their hand, and that's how districts are flipped. Even if it, they're traditionally conservative, and it's listening to what the people in those districts want. And when they go and they're like, "I recognize this name," and then that that letter next to their name matters that much less. And so I think that uh, I think that um, it's something that we've gotten really polarized about. On you know, is it a D or an R next to a name, and uh. Not not having that be the first impression that somebody has about a representative and being like, no, this person, I didn't know what, what political party they were, but they showed up in my town and they shook my hand and they talked to me. And when they go to the poll and they're reading down the list of people, that might be the one that they might be voting straight R down the list and then get to, oh, Jen Schultz. I, she, she talked to me and asked me about my life and what was important to me and that means something and, and that can do. So I, th- I think that that's the right thing to be doing. And um. Yeah, I, I don't think it matters if they don't know what political party you are when you're out there. The fact that you're out there is really what matters. Yeah, it's true. And this is a definitely a grassroots campaign because, you know, it takes millions of dollars mm-hmm. to challenge an incumbent. But the district <laughs> used to be solid Democrat DFL for 70, the last 77 years. Mm-hmm. But lately it's been trending red and went for Trump in the last mm-hmm. election. Uh, but it does matter. Grassroots, if you show up at someone's door, mm-hmm. that means a lot. And it doesn't matter what political party they're there. You, Absolutely. If you showed up at their door, you, mm-hmm. you, you want to listen to what their concerns are. They learn about you more mm-hmm. and um, they vote for you. And that's yeah. what it's going to be about is is really mobilizing thousands and thousands of volunteers to help us door knock and listen to what the folks need. Yeah, I mean, it worked for JFK, you know, mm-hmm. in Boston. So, I mean, <laughs> hopefully it works for you, too. I'm JFK really... had a little bit more money going into it well, than he did. <laughs> true, but, like, that was, like, his, like, thing that he mm-hmm. was known for was, like, being the guy who just, like, walked around and knocked on the most doors. Oh. Um, I mean, Walter Mondale, though, bringing it a little bit closer to home, was a, a huge door knocker. I mean, that was what he spent all of his time take doing. That back. <laughs> it's a kind of addictive. I did it for, mm-hmm. I was doing it for my house races. And in the Minnesota house, you run every two years. So every yeah. other year you're door knocking. I door knocked off years just mm-hmm. to talk to constituents. And I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. And sure. I door knocked every single street in my district for the Minnesota house. Um, it's a little bit different when you're running for Congress in a district this size, mm-hmm. but yeah. st- I still do door knocking. Yeah, we just well, have a lot more people. And just so our, our audience uh, understands, because you were a uh, Minnesota state representative, and your district uh, as a state representative is is much more condensed, um, and obviously uh, easier probably to to do. It doesn't take thirty thousand miles to knock on everybody's door there. No, but I started in the winter. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I wanted to do every street myself. And so I, it takes a while to get through yeah. that just half of the size of the city of Duluth. So it, and it's hilly, but um, we, did you wear I a pedometer? Get your steps in? I, I did not. I just went through. <laughs> I went through several pairs of sneakers. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's really important. That work is really really important to engage because right now you're right. People are really polarized. They're listening mm-hmm. to maybe one source of information, and to hear what people are saying and. To, you know, tell them about yourself. And it's grassroots because I'm not from a wealthy family. Yeah. I don't have a lot of friends with mm-hmm. deep pockets. I'm from very humble beginnings. And my grandfather 
emigrated to the U.S. from Holland when he was 14. He had learned some carpentry skills, came over, scraped together some money, bought a farm. So, I mean, you're technically like kids. third generation then. Yeah, I am. My grandmother never spoke. She spoke Polish. She didn't know how to read and write. This was my grandmother. Wow. They didn't have books in the house. My mother was of eight kids. With the, was the only one to go to college, and she did that when she had two babies on her hip. Me and my older sister. My father uh, was a firefighter, volunteered to go to Vietnam, and he came back and really struggled. I'm sure with PTSD from mm-hmm. that cr- the, from the war. My parents divorced and my mother had to raise me and my sister. So we've always only really known how to struggle. Mm -hmm. But that made me much stronger. And I am really I'm really not afraid of anything. And I think it's because I I had to become I had to become very independent, very young age Mm -hmm. and look out for myself. And, um, you know, I I chose economics because a faculty member, one of my professors in college said, you know, Jen, there aren't many women in the field. And this I thought, true. oh, that sounds like a challenge <laughs> yeah, right. that I want to address. Accepted. And mm-hmm. Exactly. So, you know, I'm up for a good challenge. And um, that's why I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of getting in this race yeah. and working hard to try and try to win. And it's really, I think, will make everyone in the district better off if we have better representation. I 100% agree. Thank Who is your favorite economist? I'm, I'm curious. Oh my gosh! I never try to answer favorite questions because I'm always going to know any of them. Though that's the real question. I'm going to upset a lot of people, but right now I'm really liking Janet Yellen, who's uh, you know really figuring out how to Mm -hmm. make sure we stay out of a recession and we have a soft landing from the pandemic. I think she's doing an amazing job. But you know, I I read a lot of Paul Krugman, and I read Mm -hmm. you know recently I read a really good book. If you're not an economist, I think you'll still enjoy it. But it's called The Economist's Hour Mm -hmm. by John Applebaum. Really good about how economists have had sort of an outsized influence on policy, and that's not always a good thing Mm -hmm. because economists think very differently Mm -hmm. than most people. Right. But it's a really good book, The Economist's Hour. I uh, I'll definitely be looking into it. I'm sure. a lot of our listeners will too. They're always asking me for book recommendations, and I am horrible about book recommendations because I, um, again, with the ADHD, I, I, I can't focus through books. I usually go for like the straightest, driest information that's right to the point. That's how I consume information. So, uh, um, I, I think a lot of people will appreciate some book recommendations from <laughs> from my content here. <laughs> I have so. another one for you. Oh, yeah. I assigned this mm-hmm. to my public finance class that I teach, and they really liked it. And it's a short book. Mm -hmm. But it's called Poverty by America. It's Mm -hmm. by Matthew Desmond. He won a prize for a book he wrote about, it's called Evicted. He uh, lived in a community in Milwaukee, and he followed the lives of people that were evicted and how it impacted people. But Poverty by America is a book that says, this is the problem, here's the solution, how we get out of poverty across the country. Um, and it was very direct, and the students really, really, really engaged with that book. Oh, I'll be looking into that because I, I really like direct to the point. I hate the the flowery fluff that people try to put in to to um, increase the volume of right. of words in a, in a book. I don't know, and a lot of people that's the way that they digest information. But I am suddenly off, and you know, with Alice in Wonderland somewhere, so it's hard for me. So I I appreciate that recommendation, and I I'm sure our listeners will too. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, let's get, uh, let's get back to, yeah, um, I'm good at derailing things. For. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably going to pick up one of those books myself. So mm-hmm. I feel you there. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about some of the stuff that you're really passionate about. Obviously, um, you know, the healthcare cost thing kind of got you into, um, politics, but, um, you know, what are you really looking forward to, um, you know, if you were to make it in Congress? Well, the first thing I would do in Congress, because, you know, it's very dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. You probably have heard this mm-hmm. Congress in particular. <laughs> yeah, maybe just It's a been the least, m- least productive Congress mm-hmm. in my sure. history. They passed now 26 bills because they just passed the appropriation bills to fund <laughs> right. last year's government. So, uh, <laughs> so really, the first thing is, you know, the, one of the big reasons I'm running, yeah, to work on health care reform, but let's fix stuff. Mm-hmm. Let's stop with this fighting, political fighting and... Um, blaming and complaining, which my opponent is very good at, and let's get stuff done. That's what people really want. They want people that represent them to work as hard as they're working. Mm -hmm. And they're very upset that that's not happening. And their people, you know, our taxpayer money is paying these individuals 
not to do anything. And honestly, my opponent, I think, enjoys creating this dysfunction because they don't want government to work. And we need government to function so all of our lives get better. And I think that's what we need to do. So the first thing I would do when elected is build relationships with everyone Mm -hmm. in Congress and in the Senate. doesn't matter what political party they're with. I did that in my eight years as a state legislator. I only served in divided government. No party Mm -hmm. had complete control like they do now. So 80% of my bills I introduced had bipartisan support. I had to work with the Republican-controlled Senate in Minnesota, and I got a lot done, progressive things like expanding health health, health Mm -hmm. insurance so people had more affordable coverage, increasing wages for people in in the personal care assistant Mm -hmm. industry that care workers that care for the most vulnerable um even every capital investment infrastructure uh, bonding project in my district as i I was able to fund and that it's only possible because mm -hmm. you build those relationships and i think that is what's broken down is that people are not reaching out to each other to get things done i would definitely agree, I, and I appreciate the work that you've done on healthcare here in the state because I've personally benefited from it. You know, I I used Minsure for a while, and uh, um, it's not perfect, but it's better than the alternative of a lot of states that have you know no options for somebody like me who's self employed and just genuinely can't afford healthcare. Um, it, it, what what was your uh, your favorite accomplishment? Uh. Are you, you're mo- the thing you're most proud of when you were uh, as a state legislature? Oh, I'm, pr- you know, the smallest things. It, mm-hmm. But really, you know, when I door knocked after um, I've been elected for a few years, I door knocked a gentleman in Duluth. Mm-hmm. And um, he did not have, he was an older man, not no longer working. And he did not have access to health care and his health was really bad. And I connected him to resources mm-hmm. when I'm door knocking him. And then I had a, like a coffee hour and people could just come and talk to me at a coffee shop. And this was, you know, maybe six, six months later, he came and he thanked me. And I remembered door mm-hmm. knocking him and he thanked me and he started crying and all the people around me. And he was thanking me because he, I did something to help him connect to health insurance. So it's, it's just those small things how you connect people to mm-hmm. resources that no one knows you're doing that in the background. But the most important thing is that constituent service and getting them the help they need when they need it immediately. And that's really the, the most, you know, thing that I value the most is helping people um, and doing that work. But, you know, passing legislation like Minnesota was the only state that did not protect older adults in assisted living facilities. We had some really um, awful things happen to older adults, abuse, neglect, um, and uh, it took two years, but we, we were able to license and have oversight, regulatory oversight of assisted living facilities to protect older adults. That was really important work um, that we did. But, you know, the, all of the, we have a new hospital in Duluth because I helped get the money for it. And we need to keep, we need to have the best access to the best health care. And we don't have that throughout the district. A lot of rural hospitals are closing and people, that is real, it's really, really um be very potentially bad for our rural communities because they may not thrive if a hospital closes because employers want to locate yeah. where there's good schools and good health care. Absolutely. So that will definitely be a priority is make sure we keep our rural hospitals thriving. One other thing I saw about um, some of these small towns, I think it was a small town in Minnesota, I don't remember the name of it, um, but they had found that they were losing out on people moving away because there were no like daycares at all mm-hmm. available and um, I think Minnesota has done some things to help like those type of businesses. But um, was there anything that you guys touched on or in your last you know couple um, legislative processes or yeah, sessions? The, the last few years, the, the Democrats or the DFL party in Minnesota, they have investing in child care to help in, you know, the payments we make to child care providers to get more folks interested in becoming child care providers and giving subsidies to parents. I know. Like when I, I have two boys, they're 13 and 15 now, but I signed up on a wait list to get into childcare when I found out I was pregnant. Right. Literally. And that's, that's that may not even be enough now. And Mm -hmm. people, it was expensive. A lot of people, I had, you know, pay more for childcare than they're making in wages Mm -hmm. and salary. And it, we don't want to have to force people to stay at home because childcare is too expensive. If they want to be working outside of the home, definitely want to encourage that. Mm-hmm. So this is an issue that I'm hearing a lot about, along with affordable housing. A lot of people cannot 
find starter homes and, or afford mm-hmm. the starter homes that are out there. And that's true in small communities like Bedette. Yeah. And like the most rural communities, they also need affordable housing. Yeah. I mean, well, obviously, uh, wages are often more depressed in those rural communities as well. So you have less disposable income, even though the housing can be a little bit cheaper than it is in more populated areas. The the jobs still don't support that the affordability of those houses. Um, so I... I agree that that's all stuff that uh, is definitely being um, uh, having the biggest impact, especially around uh, rural communities like this. And, and so much of your district is rural. So I appreciate the fact that you are, are listening. These are things that we were going to, you know, grill you about. How do you feel about these particular <laughs> issues? And, and we don't even have to do that because you're, you're right there on it. Yeah, but, you know, the southern part of the district is where we're seeing a lot of the population expansion mm-hmm. because, sure. you know what, because they're building affordable housing. So we have young families, young people moving into the southern part of the district, the exurbs of the Twin Cities, because they can find affordable housing and they're still commuting. But yep. um, I think a lot of people want to own a home rather than rent. And rents are really high. Yeah. So it makes sense for these young families to, to move into the district to find affordable housing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the... Um the notion that uh, we're trying to be sold today is that uh, Americans don't want to own a house. They want to be renting the American <laughs> dream, um, I think, is a ridiculous one at that. And uh, just latent propaganda at worst. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, that gener- it's, a, it's a way to invest in your retirement, really, because mm-hmm. it's a way to build wealth with yeah. your asset. Houses are appreciating a lot, and that doesn't happen with rent. No, no, no. It's not or, especially when rents are the same as a mortgage mm-hmm. most of the time these days for a, an apartment that isn't like has doesn't have like mold and stuff right. in it or something <laughs> like that or like a studio mm-hmm. that's like seven hundred dollars um, a month. Like, yeah, it's pretty insane. I mean, you've been house hunting right now too. And, I have and, a little bit, yeah, and and finding something. Um, well, and, and just even for retirement, uh, you have the opportunity to pay your house down or off to the point where you're just living expenses, even if you don't use the equity in your house. By the time you retire, hopefully your living expenses have been dramatically decreased because you don't have that mortgage where if you're renting, your rent's only going to go up indefinitely, no matter what. Uh, and um, yeah, having that, that affordability of, of uh living. I I thought it was interesting, something that I keep kind of wanting to go back to because we talked uh, about the American dream here um, on a previous episode. And uh, something that um, always gets brought up is, you know, high taxes, drive away businesses. uh, And businesses will go to all these places that have low taxes if if we if we're not competitive. And it's always one of those things that um, is used to act social programs that help people. And uh, it, personally, I think that that is a ridiculous notion. Now, I'm not a doctor in economics or anything like that, but bringing up the point that hospitals closing, um, that hurts employers because they aren't going to locate where somebody doesn't have access to health care. And uh, Minnesota, you know, people bitch about our taxes all the time, um, but we still have a, a pretty booming economy for a Midwest state. I mean, uh, aside from Chicago, uh, Illinois, we're... We're pretty much the gold standard of the Midwest as far as like e- economies go, even with our taxes. And um, a lot of that, I believe, has to do with uh, the fact that people have access to health care. They have access to uh, culture and social services and, and all of those kinds of things. And uh, I was wondering from a, a real economist perspective, um, <laughs> what, what's your perspective on uh, taxing for social services and how it affects, you know, business and, and economic growth. Well, I've, I'm always a, a supporter of fair taxation. Mm. And so what is fair? Um, there's a myth out there, and I served on the taxes committee as mm-hmm. a state legislator, um, but there's a myth out there that Minnesota is a high tax state compared mm-hmm. to other states. And when you look at the data, the facts, we're in the middle of mm-hmm. other states. And that is because other states, instead of calling it a tax, they call it a fee. So it's how you define it and add it up. But if you look at all of our taxes and our fees at the state level and the local yeah. level, Minnesota is right in the middle of states. And what people value is what our tax spending buys, yep. right? They want the best schools. And we've had historically some of the best schools, a higher mm. educated population than a lot of surrounding states. And um, we have great infrastructure. 
and we have a high quality of life in many parts of the state not for everybody but for a lot of people that's what they value and when i talk to folks there are a lot of folks moving to duluth moving to minnesota Mm -hmm. from other states that may be lower tax fee states or higher Mm -hmm. because they value all of the services that we provide with that tax revenue and we've been having surpluses Mm -hmm. um and when i the first thing that i realized when i got elected was how lean our government is, our state government, Mm -hmm. but also so impressed with the people that work for the state agency. Oh my gosh, you know, they take a big pay cut. They could Mm -hmm. be making more in the private sector, I'm sure. And they work a lot of hours, long days, Mm -hmm. weekends to do this good work for the state. So I was so impressed with the high quality of people that decide to work for the state and devote their career to the state and to the people. And so I think we do need fair taxation. And a lot of people don't understand. They they see their property tax bill if they mm-hmm. own a property. But most of that money is going to schools, to the county, mm-hmm. for the roads, for the schools. And that, that state, the state tax, the state income tax um, buys a lot. And then it's the federal tax. So there's a lot we can do that the state's been doing in the federal to lower like the social security tax right. uh, for older adults. Um, but whatever we can do to generate more fair taxation, and that's when I was a state legislator with the Republican um, ranking member of the tax committee, I closed a huge corporate tax loophole. So we're talking about fair taxation. Mm-hmm. Make sure that corporations are paying, paying their fair share so we can reduce taxes on you know, families, yeah. people, young people. And that's what has to, ha- has to happen. And for that to happen, what I realized is corporations – big industry, they have a lot of money to spend on lobbyists, and they prevent us from working on that fair taxation piece at the federal level. So what you really need is campaign finance reform. You can't, that is like key. Oh, yeah. That is like the foundation for me to be able to go to D.C. and do the work and fix things is we need campaign finance reform because my opponent, I think this cycle, $2 million from That's super PACs. That's mm-hmm. what I saw. Yeah. yeah. You see, I, I have these tough questions for you here later. And yeah. You're just ripping uh, them all out from under me before we even I get mean, there. We can, we can dive right into this, this one, especially. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sprinkle the tough questions in here as we go then. So uh, you brought it up. Uh, first and foremost, the first tough question I had written down here was, do you take PAC money? We did not take corporate PAC money in our 2022. We're not going to take corporate PAC money. We will take PAC money from groups that are aligned with their values, like Mm -hmm. unions. Mm -hmm. I have a 100% pro-labor voting record in my eight years in the Minnesota legislature from the AFL-CIO. I'm in a union. I really believe that unions protect uh, working families for their good pay and better benefits. And so, yes, I will... I will take uh, support mm-hmm. from unions and those we value, but from corporations, fossil fuel industry, mm-hmm. no, def- pharmaceutical companies, no. We will mm-hmm. say no. And I'm very proud that we our average donation is like $97, and we've had over 6,000 people donate in our fun. cycle. So awesome. we are very, and most of our, 75% of our donations are coming from the 8th District, unlike Stauber. I think he only gets 35% of <laughs> sure. his donations sure. out Which is just in the district. Crazy to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I think how – so you said you're in favor of campaign finance reform, which is one of the things that we were going to push on a little bit there. Um, what what type of legislation would you push to get rid of that? And, like, uh, do you think that people should be limited in taking donations from outside of their district? Uh, and and how, how, would, how would that be done? Do you have any uh, – Well, we need to pass Citizens United – so, you know, corporations aren't people and mm-hmm. they're buying politicians. That's what's happening now. So we need to fix that. We definitely need more transparency because these super PACs can raise unlimited amount of money mm-hmm. and spend it all. It's independent expenditures. They can buy right. commercials. As long as they don't coordinate mm-hmm. with the right. uh, yeah. right. campaign. And, and like, that's hard to, I'm sure, hard to yeah. prove. Oh, but, I'm sure um, it is. Uh, so sure we, it is. we need to set more st- limits on that and more transparency mm-hmm. about who's donating, donating, how much are they donating. But there has to be limits. There should also be public subsidies like we do in Minnesota. Yeah. If you decide you're only going to uh, spend this much money, you're eligible mm-hmm. for a public subsidy. And um, that can limit how much people spend on their campaign yeah. but we can shorten the campaign cycle i mean mm-hmm. there's there's just a lot we can do but we definitely have to reduce spending on political campaigns because it's outrageous i mean most the average i think is like 25 million dollars 
for yeah. Congress. And, and we talk about all the time about how like we need younger people and just, mm-hmm. you know, progressive people, but mostly younger people to step up and, you know, start representing themselves um, in our, in our Congress and in our um, legislators. And, uh, you know, the first thing we always talk about is like, well, a, how much money do you need to raise? But mm-hmm. then B is like, how are you going to survive while you're running and how long is that going to take? And, and how feasible is that for you? If you have a rent payment or if you have a mm-hmm. mortgage and if you're not getting any income, it's like, boy, that, that doesn't make it very appealing to somebody who does want genuinely mm-hmm. to help and make a difference in the world. But financially, it's just not possible. Exactly. I mean, you see a lot of people who are retired, independently wealthy, mm-hmm, right. running for office. And we do we need a lot of young people yeah. <laughs> running with their young values. And um, that is very, it's a big barrier to running for office. I mean, right. I have a day job and I have more flexibility as a professor and faculty member to run and I'm older. Um, but you know, it's a consideration and most people, they're like, they can't fit it into their Mm -hmm. life, raising a family and having a full-time job and then running for Congress, which is another full-time job. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, and and then fundraising on top of it, would you be in favor of, uh, getting rid of all campaign donations and going to publicly funded elections? Sure. I would be very open to that. I think if I could spend more time and I'd spend a lot of time doing the actual work. I mean, people in Congress, when I went to DC last fall, they will, in between when you know bills are supposed to be heard on the floor and committee, they will go off site to an office and start dialing for dollars. And if we if they didn't have to do that, they could be working, meeting people, building relationships, and getting the work done to fix things. Right, and yeah. things especially out. yeah, especially in Congress when it's every two years that they have to run. That means every year they're basically campaigning. You know they. They get a few months. I mean, when you talk about the, the time that they take off, because um, they're not in session all the time, the time that they take off, they're they're really doing their job for a few months, and then the rest of their time in office is spent fundraising and campaigning for the next election. And that's how, and their votes are guided by which mm-hmm. special interest is going to give me more money if I take this vote, which is against the interest of the people of mm-hmm. my district, because people aren't tra- most people aren't tracking how their congressperson votes, yeah. and that is a big downside is that Mm -hmm. and i see people coming becoming more disengaged because they're so tired of the political polarization so how are we going to re-engage people and make sure they're educated about who they're electing and what their elected person um, how they're voting yeah the apathy is real um Mm -hmm. i don't know i'm sure your students have told you or or mentioned um i don't know if you heard of something called doom scrolling Mm -hmm. but uh that's a thing now it's a trend Mm -hmm. and it's Mm -hmm. not because like or it is because like that's a real thing that people are going through is they they're feeling like there's really no hope and it's just like well let's see what the next thing is today how is you know how is the wor- world getting worse off um and that sucks right. yeah there i mean i see that with my students and their um mental health has probably worse you know the, it was the pandemic but it was, i think it is also being on social media and doom scrolling and um, there was a recent survey about happiness, and young people are reporting that they're just not happy as you know people over fifty five. Mm-hmm. So what? Why are they reporting being so unhappy? What's mm-hmm. going on in their life? And I'm very, I'm very concerned about their mental health, and I see it every day with my students. Right. I don't think uh, banning TikTok is going to help their mental health <laughs> no. necessarily. Um, I think um, there's the you know the future uh, existential threat of uh, climate change to just mm-hmm. name a single topic that uh, that might be affecting you know or the fact their, that they'll never own a house right or, or yeah <laughs> those type of things if, uh, if, if they get a, a slightly sick it may bankrupt them <laughs> yeah um, yeah don't don't take out that medical debt uh, um, you you might not ever get rid of it but but speaking of banning TikTok this was another one of the uh, the tough questions I had on here um, obviously at uh, at the uh, at the dinner we met at, um, Angie Craig uh, spoke and and you uh, reiterated this is the most dysfunctional, unproductive, incompetent Congress in in history, uh, which Angie is is a part of, um, and, uh, and 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 she spoke on that and, and I agree. Um, but then they managed to uh, shove through a TikTok ban bill in eight days, which she voted for, and. Um, as younger progressive people and a lot of people get involved a lot of people understand how government works and and news in the world and 
you know, um, obviously we wouldn't be having this interview right now if it wasn't for TikTok because that's that's how we uh, are in a roundabout way made our connection. That's why I'm doing this right now. Um, uh, so it felt really like insulting um, the, the way that they voted. And then the lines of bullshit that they sold us. I don't know if you were caught up on the Jeff Jackson uh, side of the, the TikTok ban deal and, and the kind of backlash he's received from that. Um, but, uh, how, how do you feel about that? Where is your perspective on that? Well, you know, I don't have complete information cause I'm not privy to the national security briefings that mm-hmm. I think our Congress people are privy to. Mm-hmm. And I'll just say on defense of Angie Craig, she's mm-hmm. in the minority. So there's mm-hmm. like, it's difficult to get things accomplished when you're in the minority. But, um, I think there's over 170 million users on TikTok. Yeah. A lot of people depend the on country. their income <laughs> and I'm a big mm-hmm. supporter of, freedom of speech Mm -hmm. and choices and um, ways to generate income for people, especially young people. So I don't think I would have voted with Angie Craig. I think I would have voted to keep TikTok. But like I said, I don't know the national security implications, but my, I kind of have like, I'm not a conspiracy conspiracy theorist at Mm -hmm. all, but I'm like, why do they want to ban TikTok? Is it because Elon Musk, they want Elon Musk to own Mm -hmm. it and they want more control like Twitter X? Right. Why is it? Why can't you know? Why can't the the, I, the company that owns it? Why can't we just put on more oversight and regulatory oversight? Abs- you know, why they don't need to sell it? So Absolutely. I I think that there's I think there's more nuance to mm-hmm. this. But I would be investigating if I was in Congress. Well, I, I'm I'm happy to hear that, and and I appreciate you uh, you bringing that up because I'm I tend to not be a conspiracy theorist either. Um, and uh, it just seems it just seems really disingenuous because a lot of it was sold on these national security concerns that have been actual real demonstrable problems with Facebook and and Twitter and uh, Instagram you know where we have Russian bots influencing uh, our our political process or and political ads on Facebook being purchased by foreign entities exactly you know, like small these, things like that these are all all the things that like they're like oh this could happen with TikTok and it's like it has been happening with American-owned companies, and you haven't given a shit, and now you can't elect a speaker of your house, and then you can't re-elect a speaker of your house, and you can't pass a budget for how many times have they gone through that now? Um, you know, you can't get anything productive done. They can't pass the immigration bill. That I mean, that was a, a, a gift basket to the Republicans, and they couldn't even pass that. Uh, and but they're like TikTok ban. We can we can get that done by lunch, and <laughs> yeah. and that um you know felt really disingenuous to us. And I think that that is kind of what drives the disengagement and a lot of the apathy and a lot of the anger towards Congress is is that sort of uh that sort of thing. And and uh building off of the the conspiracy theory aspect of this to the last kind of tough question um was a lot of people really feel uh, that, you know, our issue, um, the the unrest in the Middle East, specifically with Israel and Gaza, um, and Israel obviously has a lot of lobby money in Congress. APAC is huge. Um, we have had a very long, uh, uh, interesting relationship and alliance with Israel and um, not the most ethical, moral history in the past. Obviously, at the dinner, there was plenty of, of protesters outside. One made it inside. Um and uh, and I and I empathize with them. I empathize with that situation. And a lot of people are getting their information for the first time and really realizing what is not a new issue, but they are seeing this issue for the first time on TikTok. And uh, a lot of people wonder, you know, maybe maybe that's some of that money that's been influencing. Like they don't like the fact that this is really making it hard to control uh, the the PR view of this situation and Democrats and Republicans alike have sort of tiptoed around the issue of Israel and Gaza. And I guess we wanted to ask you, you know, straight out, where would you be on this? Because this is a huge millennial issue, a huge uh, Gen Z issue, something they're very passionate about and something that we really feel that we've been ignored about all the way up the ladder. Yeah. It's something like um, 70 or 80% of um, Democrats under the age of 35 are like pro um immediate ceasefire um so it's it's a very strong you know metered topic Mm -hmm. i guess i think people should be asking folks running for any office their Mm -hmm. views honestly and i you know this is in my lifetime it's been the middle east has been difficult Mm -hmm. it's been everybody wants peace that's Mm -hmm. everyone is there everybody wants peace 
So we definitely need an immediate ceasefire. Okay. A hundred percent. We need to rescue as many hostages as possible. Israel has the right to protect itself. Israel has the right to um, um, prosecute the terrorists. Um, but it's a humanitarian crisis we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. And people are starving in Absolutely. Gaza. Mm-hmm. Innocent people are being killed. Children. Are Children really... are being killed. We, as a wealthy country, we need to. We should have responded for more humanitarian aid earlier. We should have had a heart to heart with Netanyahu <laughs> about his strategy. And I think Biden needs to step up and insert the power of the U.S. into those negotiations, so we can come up with a two state solution mm-hmm. and we can help the innocent people that are struggling in Gaza and the Palestinians right now immediately. Um, and I think I would say, hopefully I'm in the next couple of weeks, I think there's going to be a lot more pressure on Israel and to have a cease immediate ceasefire and mm. channels hopefully will open up to get more aid to Gaza and stop the killing. I mean, my goodness, we all have to live on this earth, right? We are all humans and, mm. Um, we, there's, there's going to be other dangers that we need to work on and solve as a, you know, united countries against climate change, for instance, Mm -hmm. we're going to have millions of people that need to migrate to where they can have clean water to drink to, you know, (laughs) where they can sustain life, Mm -hmm. not in 105 degree heat. I mean, there's, there's just going to be huge challenges. We cannot keep fighting religious wars and war over property. We, we have to solve these problems. And it's been something that's been going on my whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like when are we going to get smart about we're all humans and we need to live together and we need to tackle these bigger problems. I, I, I want. I appreciate the fact, like that yeah. was a a fairly straightforward answer on a, definitely a, a a top hot button topic at the moment. So you, I I would assume then from uh, that that you would disagree on how we've handled like the UN resolutions on a ceasefire and and vetoing those. Um, not to put you on the spot or anything, but like that's kind of been a a, a big thing. Is like yeah. the rest of the world sort of agree like this should have been an issue you know and you're saying in a couple weeks you think there's going to be a a lot of pressure and that's a couple of months too late um you know uh so you you would definitely not be voting for um continued funding of uh israel at this point until they they continue or they they figure out how to not kill children anymore yeah i don't know where the funding is going in Mm -hmm. israel so i i can't fully answered that yeah, question I but i was thinking the same thing too when we were i was listening to an interview and it was like they're for funding the genocide it's like well like mm-hmm. how exactly yeah. are we doing that i know that we're providing aid in some some ways whether mm-hmm. that's military aid or i, I doubt it's a direct dollar no it's it almost never certainly is. like yeah. ammunition of some sort or, mm-hmm. or arms i mean i know a lot's gone towards the iron dome defense system and whatnot right uh but again spending money to help Israel defend itself while they are literally bombing refugee camps uh, that are full of children is, is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that this is being reviewed at the Hague and are there, Mm -hmm. is there any violation of international law Mm -hmm. by either groups? And, um, I think that there was $3 billion in the last appropriation bill. And I think some mem- members, you know, Democratic mm-hmm. members voted no because they didn't want to continue funding yeah. Israel. And right. so where where does that money go? And is it the defense industry that's getting the money? Like mm-hmm. where who's actually getting yeah. the money? And yeah, who's, heard, who's lobbying for that besides mm-hmm. APAC and others? I've heard for like Ukraine that what we're doing is we're sending like physical arms and ammunition. Yeah. And then and we're essentially... actual aid supplies like... Uh, True, food but, and blankets types. But stuff, then yeah. on the on the domestic side is what we're doing is we're then dishing out to the military industrial complex to mm-hmm. resupply our own supplies. We're like, getting rid of our old supplies mm-hmm. and then just paying our industry to make new guns and new ammunition. So we're still sort of funding the beast, even if we're giving yeah. aid. Mm-hmm. It's just like recycling, you know, previously spent money. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. 
doesn't seem like the greatest thing for us. <laughs> no, people, so, there yeah. are a lot of people in the district that are unhappy mm. that we give any money to any mm-hmm. other country, that we're not fixing domestic issues yeah. and focusing on domestic problems here. Sure. But, yeah. And I always say, well, we're the wealthiest country mm-hmm. on this planet. We can do and both. <laughs> we can do both. Exactly. We can do both. And because we're in this position, we are fighting for democracy around the world. And there mm-hmm. are a lot of countries that need us. Like Ukraine needs us. They are struggling. They are fighting for democracy. Yeah. There are a lot of folks who, um, whose parents, grandparents came from that part of the world. Mm-hmm. And they care about what's happening there. And right. so I think, yeah, I think we can do both. And it's our responsibility as the wealthiest country to promote and protect um, people that are, want to live in, in a democracy. In a purely like pragmatic and economic sense, it is... A lot cheaper to send some money to Ukraine than to fight a war with Russia ourselves. And and ultimately, you, you know, uh, Putin's been uh, testing his boundaries when uh, he invaded Georgia, when he annexed Crimea, now invading Ukraine. And after Ukraine, Poland is kind of the next logical <laughs> step. And Poland is a NATO country. And it, if Poland gets invaded, we are in World War Three. That is, we are boots on the ground in Europe. Um, and that is an expensive proposition uh, that will inevitably involve a lot of aid, providing the world doesn't end in you know nuclear fallout. So uh, it it just makes a lot of sense to aid Ukraine for our own self preservation. And uh, yeah, it just it just feels like very <laughs> much like a proxy war. Mm-hmm. And I I just it it's makes cringy. me hurt it's inside. It's so cringy. Um, I mean, I, is... I I totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. Like, there's there's no way that we should be allowing. Putin to gain governmental control over the country of Ukraine. Mm-mm. There's no, there's no reason for him to do it uh, other than the ones that he's manufactured in, uh, you know, the made denazification up. of a Jewish, right. like, <laughs> a, a uh, Jewish-led country. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I but, mean, I don't trust Putin. No, and right. I, no. Yeah, of course. And I think people should question who they elect because you know Trump is, I would say, a Putin puppet. Oh in my, my God, book, he absolutely and, is. And we need to be cautious of that, cautious of that. But yeah, I think preventing him Russia from overtaking Ukraine is a lot cheaper now than than you know mm-hmm. him going into Putin going into other countries and um, overthrowing their government. Absolutely, and the, and yeah. I mean even like uh, Ukraine is the the world's breadbasket, right? Or uh, the breadbasket of Europe. And if if we think grocery prices are expensive now, imagine what they'll be once Putin has control over you know production of food for the majority of Europe. We've already seen how it's affected energy prices. Um, so just for uh, a regular American's bottom line, their their pocketbook that can have real impact on it that is mitigated by that foreign aid. And it's, I mean, it, right now it's a little bit more um, than in, in non-Russia uh, trying to start World War Three years, but it's generally less than 1% of our budget goes to foreign aid. I mean, it's it's next to nothing, $30, $40 billion a year when it's not, you know, fighting wars and... Yeah, I just love the foreign aid. Whenever somebody says, oh, mm-hmm. we should be fixing domestic pro- you know, problems mm-hmm. first, I always think it's like, well... If we're gonna brag about being like the best guy on the team, mm-hmm. like shouldn't we like support our teammates a little <laughs> yeah. bit? You know, like who wants? To, do you really want to see somebody like more polarizing than Randy Moss on our team? <laughs> like somebody who thinks they're better than they yeah. are than he was? Yep. Like we've seen how that goes. It's not the greatest. No, it is how we we, we generally run things. No, though. it I is mean, actually how we kind of actually do things. <laughs> like if you look at how we bully our like our their, like so-called allies in like mm-hmm. nato and the g7 like we're kind of that guy already mm-hmm. but um anyways uh, let's 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 <laughs> kind of run through a couple things um that uh that we wanted to get into um one of them being um something we talk about all the time here is rank choice voting mm-hmm. um i'm sure that you being kind of on the receiving end of voting um you have some opinion on on that overall it's um can be more efficient ranked mm-hmm. choice voting and it can get more people interested in running mm-hmm. um so overall supportive but i have a bunch of phd mathematicians <laughs> that worry about some anomaly some like rare yeah. things happening and how to game the system yes yeah, so my answer is uh... going to be way more nuanced but you know there's 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 
I'm a two-handed economist. There's benefits and there's drawbacks. Right. Yeah, we did a whole episode on like a kind of campaign restructuring or just reform, and part of it was ranked choice voting. And I brought up a different method called the star method, which supposedly gets rid of some of the gamification of ranked choice voting. But we've sort of just rested on ranked choice voting as like the like the slogan for like voting change. Because star method is still like a version of ranked choice voting. It's like a two different voting methods yeah. combined. Mm-hmm. In, one of them is ranked choice voting. Um, so I, I understand your concerns because mm-hmm. that was my concern too because I dove into it. I was like, what are you talking about? Ranked choice voting isn't actually like the best. It's mm-hmm. like just a little bit better than uh, the plurality that we have. So um, that's that's a totally I fair think response. There are lots of other options, but what is your goal? It needs to can't be too complicated. Mm-hmm. People need to understand it, and you need to limit that how people could game the system. People with power, people with money, well, and yeah. so I just think simple sometimes is best. And maybe right. ranked choice voting is the simplest way to reform. Right, and and that's that was kind of my thing too. Is what we decided was like, yeah, like there are other methods that would be potentially better voting methods, mm-hmm. uh, like just statistically, but like. Ranked choice voting is a lot easier to mm-hmm. understand, and that is certainly, you know, the actual adoption rate of that is, is going to be influenced on how easy it is. Um, but the biggest reason why we're, like, so much for it is because it kind of allows citizens to sidestep mm-hmm. campaign financing and lobbying if you have the ability to, you know, vote for more than one person, A, but also, say, you know, rank the preference of your voting. Um, so we think it's it's essentially... It's a non-starter to to not think that we need something um, something to change within our voting actual apparatus, um, especially if we're not really in a position to get rid of Citizens United. Mm-hmm. Which, as, mm-hmm. as of right now, I really don't feel <laughs> like that's uh, like on the docket. So, like, if if we can control one thing, like I would say, I, I'm all for ranked choice voting because it has to be um, something that we do. And, and it's it's interesting too because our uh, our own Secretary of State thinks that uh, we're not even smart enough as Minnesotans to figure out ranked choice voting. Um, he said he, that he thought it was too complicated for us, which I don't know if they can figure out how to vote. There's for, a couple of cities in Minnesota that yeah. already do it on their mm-hmm. local. I think um, it well, yeah, the Minneapolis mayor's mm-hmm. race, Alaska. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you, Alaska, for yeah. doing ranked choice Minnetonka voting. Minnetonka has it. Mm-hmm. Um, Nevada is coming up this year um, in November mm-hmm. for a ballot measure for primaries. That's, I mean, a, a, and I'm all for it. I I don't understand why we don't do it, and especially um, why uh, it kind of surprised me from. Steve Simon was uh, it, it tends to be more beneficial to Democrats because, you know, it, it, the people who vote Democrat are a broader scope of people. Right. You, you've got uh, moderate party line Democrats that are, are right there in the middle. And then you've got kind of the, the far left progressives that are like, I'm voting Democrat because there's literally no other option that even remotely um, represents what we want. And those people are a lot more likely to go vote third party. Mm-hmm. And th- so, so, so we're essentially losing votes. Obviously, we saw it with, with uh, Nader and Gore in Florida and in um, what, the 2000 election. And uh, there was some other aspects that, that kind of <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> fed in, maybe a into bit. that. Some hanging <laughs> chads, some Supreme Court decisions, right. uh, some... Uh, interesting relationships between the governor and the presidential candidate, but um, the the fact that like had those people been able to say this is my second choice and he didn't get those percentages that he needed, um, th- there's an argument to be made that Gore likely would have won in that situation. Uh, there's probably an argument to be made that um, Hillary may have fared better uh, in that same situation with ranked choice voting. So to to see our own Secretary of State say that he didn't think that that was a good idea um, kind of baffled me a little bit, and I, I I, just don't see the downside to it at this point. I know that there is definitely some drawbacks, uh, potential problems, but there's plenty of drawbacks and potential problems to what we currently have, and I right. think that as, as Democrats and people on the left alike, that gives people more of an opportunity to try to break that two-party system and, and vote their conscience, vote for who they want to vote for, without 
possibly letting us end up with you know mango mussolini in uh in the next election um, i think that pr- yeah i mean the problem is we're stuck in this two-party system we need more than two parties right. and with the with campaign finance and the amount of money it takes it's really hard to break out of that mold mm-hmm, right. of two parties but i honestly wholeheartedly think that we need more than two parties because a lot there's a lot of people that don't identify with either party yeah. right now well and 50 percent of america doesn't vote every year mm-hmm. maybe right. if there was an additional party we get a couple more mm-hmm. million yeah. you know so yeah minnesota is the exception we have very high voter voter turnout rates especially sure. in the eighth district both mm-hmm. sides both parties people mm-hmm. vote but mm-hmm. um yeah i think we we need to make it easier to have more than two parties well, I, I agree. Well, speaking of um, the eighth district, um, so obviously you ran against Pete in 2022 um, and came up a little bit short, unfortunately. Um, is there anything that you are doing differently this time, or is there a circumstances or the environment that you feel um, that's changed, or are you just you know more veteran in the process of, of running for this type of office? Yeah. Well, we did run in 2022, and like I said, I was still a state legislator, and yep. so we didn't. I renounced very late in the cycle and we didn't really start doing anything okay. until May and then the election was November. So we got in the race late. So this time we're in much earlier. Yeah. You're, you're ahead announced, of that for sure. We're raising money and we did well in 2022. Yeah, we raised absolutely. like, I don't know, $750,000 in a few months, you know, drove all over the district. We were endorsed by seven of the largest conservative newspapers, Forum Communications, that which is, had hmm. never happened. They'd Amazing. never endorsed a non-incumbent in this seat. Sure. So that was historic. And it was very positive, glowing review of me and very critical of Stauber for a conservative group. It was um, a big win for us. And then we were endorsed by almost every labor union, including mm-hmm. you know, the steel workers, the miners. Mining mm-hmm. is a big, big issue on the, on the Iron Range. And environmental groups. So that's I mean, also that's, historic. That's impressive. Uh, for people outside of Minnesota listening in or people who just don't pay that close of attention to, to this kind of thing, um, it's it's always kind of the, the battle for our iron range. We have a huge mining community. Minnesota produces the most iron ore, iron that's taconite now, but raw iron comes uh, comes from our state. You know, we, we built everything that was built out of steel in World War II and have continued to do it ever since. Uh, or at least mind the raw material for it. Um, and obviously there's always a lot of big environmental concerns that come with mining. And so you have uh, Minnesota that has a really rich um, environmental uh, outdoor. We've got some beautiful, beautiful state parks and a national park and uh, people who are really passionate about um, cons- conservation. You got people who are really passionate about, you know, especially up in the Iron Range. There's not a whole lot of other economic opportunities up there, uh, and and those two kind of come head to head a lot. So for for Jen to be endorsed by both uh, the the miners and the environmental groups is um, a a pretty big deal. Um, I think that if you don't pay attention to these kind of things, it's hard to understand how how big that is. So that is incredible. Yeah, we're proud of that, mm-hmm. and we hope to repeat all of that this mm-hmm. year. And now that I'm starting earlier, we're getting a lot more support from statewide elected officials, and we've grown our volunteer base. And so I've, it's we're in a much different space. And then recently, Stauber took credit for a $1 billion infrastructure yeah. investment in the Blotnick Bridge, oh, which yeah, connects two communities <laughs> over a uh, Great Lake, Lake Superior. Mm-hmm. And he not only like took credit, he it, there was a press embargo, and he put out his press release Monday. Biden was traveling to the region on <laughs> Thursday, oh, pre- preempted that announcement by Biden, and That's he pissed crazy. off a lot of people, including the White House, Huffington Post. I mean, it's the national news were calling; mm-hmm. they were calling out his hypocrisy for taking credit, and that is really resonating around the district. They cannot believe he did that, and he's it's not just with this Blotnick Bridge billion dollar investment. He goes around the district and takes credit for all these infrastructure projects that mm-hmm. he voted against. Right. And, I mean, he's lying, and people mm-hmm. are done with They're so done with the lies. They just want politicians, elected people that tell the truth. Like, yeah. what is the truth? They don't believe him anymore. You voted against, stand up and say why you voted against it. Say, you know, I, I didn't believe that it was worth the expenditure. I didn't believe it was worth spending your tax dollars. But don't sit there and uh, vote against it and then be like, yeah, see what I did for you? I, I got you this <laughs> this brand new bridge check that out you know yeah. and uh, so all those things are going to help us win this certainly. year and 
and he endorsed Trump. And so I think there's a lot, you know, this mm. was, you know, people came out for Trump, but I think folks are rethinking that. And I know Minnesotans are, you know, they they care who their elected official is. They're smart. Um, they're not going to be duped again by anybody. And so they're going to make sound choices in November. And I think just, you know, in the primary for president, in Minnesota, 20% of the Republicans that came out, and you have to identify which party mm-hmm. you're in to vote, they voted for Nikki Haley. So yeah. if we can just get half mm. those folks yeah. to vote for us sure. in November, we win because we yeah. only have to make an eight point, make up an eight point difference, which is, you know, used to be a really close race, eight yeah. points. I, well, I, I, I'm super excited. How have you been uh, faring with the uh, agriculture community? Because that's also a big one, huge one in this district. Yeah, we were endorsed. And this was also the first time the Farmers um, Union endorsed a non-incumbent. So they're, you know, the reason why I was I, I ran in 2022, I was meeting with a group of farmers and they asked me to run. That is and awesome. so they are credited with getting me sure. to run because yeah. they really begged me to run because they were not getting what they needed from Stauber. And so um, I'm very tied into what our farmers need um, in the community. And it's probably because one of their top issues was health coverage. They mm-hmm. really needed affordable health insurance for well, their I mean, families. It's, it's hard. My my family was a farming family until Reagan put them out of business, you know, and uh, um we still have a lot of friends who uh, who are very heavily in the agriculture industry. Uh, both my properties are are farmed and rented out. I mean, I don't I don't do it because I can't make anything grow. But um, p- people who can make you it got grow, two apple trees, yeah. in your property that you probably don't I, do anything. I didn't do. They them. just they just happened <laughs> to do really well. Yeah. And and but uh, horses love them though. Yeah, they really do. Um, there, I met a lot of young people that mm-hmm. are becoming farmers. They well, want to go this back one to right land. here. He's yeah. got yeah. he's got all the dreams of being. Uh, little wife and I are looking to get some, uh, get some acreage in probably not the eighth. It's a little bit far. We we work in like Maple Groveish area, but um, well, within, you did like, just look at a house in North Branch. We did though. look in a place. Yeah, a house in North Branch had fourteen acres. We were looking to do some homesteading. Some you know, it's a very lovely community. I mm-hmm. recommend yeah. North yeah. Branch, um, but they need help because land is very expensive. Mm-hmm. Interest rates are high. It so was a tough, young, yeah, it was a tough bid. We help. yeah, we didn't get the you know they didn't accept our bit our mm-hmm. offer. I think they got like four or five offers on the house. So it's it's a competitive market still. Mm-hmm. But no, no, that's that's awesome, and that is a huge deal because. Uh, Agriculture is one of the biggest, the biggest aspects of Minnesota, just in general. We're a huge agricultural state, and um, Mill City. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and obviously, uh, I think the farmers got a little blinded by Trump um, in in 2016 and and 2020, and I'm hoping that they're starting to come around. Uh, and it's it's encouraging to see that you well, know I think the the trade war and all that with China, Mm -hmm. I think that had to make a big difference. I mean, it helped, though, that uh, the anti-welfare queen people got a bunch of welfare from Trump for him fucking up their trade markets like that. (laughs) Just uh, The the hypocrisy is always a tough one for me to to swallow with a straight face and be like, I'm taking you serious when you, you know, bitch about people getting free money and then you're sitting here, well, Trump's great. I can't sell any of my grain, so he wrote me gigantic amounts of free checks for... For all the grain that I can't sell because he doesn't know how to economy. Yeah, and we have a lot of lives, people raising livestock mm-hmm. in the eighth too. And, the, you know, if we're mm-hmm. exporting a lot of our meat, um, yeah. it's important, those relationships with other countries. And I think, yeah, Trump has not been helpful in that, no. that regard. And I, I worry about if he was elected in November, like mm-hmm. who would work for Trump and what would his administration right. look like? I think there'd be a lot of unfilled positions. The folks that work on those trade issues and farming well, issues, and they couldn't even pass a farm bill on time. Right, Usually right. that's the mm-hmm. most nonpartisan mm-hmm. bill right. that there is. Yeah. Uh, as far as filling positions go, I don't know if you followed uh, or heard of Project 2025 at all. It's something we've been following. Um, apparently it's, it's essentially the Reagan plan mm-hmm. uh, for how to run the government, uh, federal agencies mm-hmm. and such. And, um, They've been accepting applications yeah. for offices that have not even been opened um, to uh, Trump appointing them or not. So um, there's some weird, uh, vague things going on with that whole process. Yeah, and the Republican Study Committee, I don't know if you've looked at their report that came out last hmm. week, but Stauber's part of this committee, and there mm-hmm. are like 100 other Republicans are on this committee, and I think the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, helped them write their plan for 2025. 
Mm-hmm. And so in writing, it lays out what they want to do if they're in control. You know? yeah. And they some of these things, I know it may not impact your young people now, but you know the 8th District is an older population, and they want to cut social security payments mm-hmm. they want to raise the age for eligibility for social security yeah. and they make medicare more expensive by their premium subsidy program yeah. but there's a bunch in there mm-hmm. and people should read it it's like a little over 100 pages but they should read it because this is what they're going to be voting on in november yeah. and that's what they want and the heritage right. foundation is the the ones who designed uh reagan's platforms and policies right. that you know are affecting us today i I, I don't know that even even Trump included, I don't know that we've had a more damaging president with more damaging policies than Ronald Reagan. And uh, and the Heritage Foundation was behind that and they're still behind it today. And um, they know how to play a long game uh, and they've done it very successfully. And uh, if, if we allow them to continue um, doing that, we're going to have some. Uh, yeah. Some big problems. And I, you know, I didn't always know this because mm-hmm. I've become smarter as I get mm-hmm. older. But, you know, I've always been an underdog and I've mm-hmm. always fought for the underdog and not just in sports, but, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in life. And that's what Republicans really care about money and mm-hmm. greed and protecting their wealth and corporations. And they are trying to dupe the rest of us, mm-hmm. you know, the rest of us poor, low income, middle income people. And we have to get wise to that. That we need, pe- we need to send people to Congress and to the presidency who care about working class families, yep. who actually care about helping us thrive and not just corporations and their greed and their wealth. And I am very worried that Trump is bought by those elite, wealthy, uh, minority, small group of people so they can control him and he would be their puppet to do what is in their self-interest I just don't think they care about the little person anymore. And no. and I do, and that's what motivates me to run. And then the other issue you guys haven't brought up, but I think is a big deal given what just happened in the special election in Alabama, is reproductive rights and the right mm-hmm. to abortion and to let women make their own health care choices. And Stauber is on the wrong end of that yeah. completely. He he uh, is against uh, even uh, IVF treatment. He has a bill that would prevent it. He's a co-sponsor of that bill. He votes against rights to uh, abortion and access. And he even voted against access to birth control. So he is so extreme. I hope... I hope all young people care about this, not oh, just women, but young mm-hmm. men too, because oh. I don't think a lot of young men want to become a parent. No, uh, <laughs> when I was twenty, uh, that's for sure. I, I I still don't want to become one. So uh, no, and I and I appreciate you bringing that yeah, up. It's yeah. honestly, it's something we talk about a lot. It's something that um, I specifically think the. Uh, the Democrats should almost have no other platform for 2024 than reproductive rights. Right. I think that this has proven to be across the country. So why, when you have people in Ohio showing up to off-year special elections and and ballot referendums to vote to codify, you know, reproductive rights, um, and the fact that the the red wave um, of the midterms turned into a, a red puddle and. Uh, and that was all based around reproductive rights. A hundred percent that that is what you know Democrats need to be focusing on. Um, and we were we we're talking about this earlier. Um, uh, w- w- we were actually in the middle of filming another episode when when Jen showed up today, and uh, so we're we're splitting that one up. But we were talking about um, you know Republicans and Democrats being the same, and this being one of those issues where it's it's absolutely not the same um and i i do not i don't think that we're giving enough pressure on this particular topic uh so i apologize for not bringing that one up earlier yeah, we definitely it was kind of weird because we hammered like it was hammered in mm-hmm. 2022 uh leading up to that midterm and it really hasn't been to even a, like mm-hmm. half as much as it was i would i feel like um as like the driving point right. which is little bit concerning considering mm-hmm. this is like the election that well, kind of matters a little bit more than the midterms potentially yeah and we were talking about this in 2022 and we were really like frustrated with both sides you know being the same or not the same but like uh, uh the fact that it wasn't codified in 2022 or 2021 when we in theory at least had the ability to try to codify it even if it hadn't made it through the senate um so i 
I know that the Democrats know that this should be the winning issue that they're they're really hammering on, and I'm really proud of our state for codifying these rights and and yeah. enshrining them in our constitution. And uh, it's one of the things that makes Minnesota such a great state. And the work that you've done, obviously, in contributing to that, um, writing legislation and voting in favor of legislation and working across the aisle to get this legislation passed. So we have, I mean, the the laundry list of things that the Minnesota State Legislature has accomplished this past session makes uh, both of us incredibly proud yeah. to be Minnesotan. And I think that we are we are kind of leading the way. We are the the blueprint for what the rest of the country should be doing. But there is a risk, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's language in our Consti state constitution, but it's still mm -hmm. gray. Like, mm -hmm. we could be preempted by anything that happens at the federal level. And we were, they, you know, the state legislature was thinking about putting the question on access to abortion on the ballot for to change the language in our constitution. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen this year. So we are still, you know, feel people may not bring it up right now because they think in Minnesota mm -hmm. we're safe. But literally if stuff happens at the federal level, more things like, you know, the, up in front of the Supreme court right now is Mifepristone and access mm -hmm. to Mifepristone. And that's going to affect um, our state. And right now our clinics, our reproductive health clinics are being overwhelmed by people coming from out of the state mm -hmm. to get their health care. Yeah. And women are, you know, they're putting their lives at risk in these states that have outlawed it because they're at risk if they need an abortion because mm -hmm. uh, they don't have a viable pregnancy and they're getting sepsis. I mean, mm -hmm. we are seeing this yeah. happen. This is crazy. This yeah. should and not be it's not, be it's not even a hypothetical. It's, it's, no. it's actually women are are dying. Women are dying not because they want an abortion, but because they literally cannot survive their own pregnancy and they're not legally allowed to get an abortion and healthcare providers can't take the risk because they could be criminally prosecuted or lose their license in those states because of the way that they've criminalized these things. And, and I it's, think, yeah, I think Biden said it mm -hmm. well to stay the union, right? Hey, you're going to see how much power women have mm -hmm. in the, in voting. I hope women so. are going to yeah. come out and just yeah. vote on this issue. I think throughout the country. Right. Yeah. I mean, if there was ever, there's a, there's a couple issues that you could say is like, mm -hmm. if there was ever a single issue to go vote on, um, mm -hmm. certainly abortion, uh, access is, um, is one of those. Just women's health care access in general, because it's not just True. abortion. No, I yeah. mean, you look at the, right. the IVF deal in Alabama with, oh, you, you trip and drop, uh, some frozen embryos that were never going to be a human being. And suddenly you're on the hook for wrongful death. Well, who's going to who's going to take on who's going to assume that risks to help women have children, let alone, you know, not have them. And yeah, it's it's just absolutely insane. And uh, uh, I forget who said it. I'm definitely plagiarizing this. But uh, somebody said there's just uh, there's not enough room in a in a doctor's office for a woman, her doctor and all of fucking Congress. So <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 true, and it's one of the big things that um we're incredibly happy to hear that you're on on the right side of, and it's one of the few things you can confidently say. There's a very blatant right and wrong side of this one, mm -hmm. and Republicans know that they're on the wrong side of it. And I think Democrats need to continue to beat into people's heads how important or or how hard they're working to be on the right side of this issue. Yeah, and I always tell folks, you know, we should solve this problem. It's been polarizes mm -hmm. people, right? It's about religion and other things, morals. But what really is, could happen is that we could put enough research money mm -hmm. into preventing mm -hmm. unwanted pregnancies, so we wouldn't need abortions for unwanted pregnancies. At, we can absolutely mm -hmm. solve that. Will we never need abortions? No, because to save a woman's life, often mm -hmm. if she has a non a, not a viable pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Abortion is a medical procedure, but we can eliminate, I think, with research funding, more money for women's health. And Biden just announced this initiative to put more money into researching women's health, which has been really neglected in, mm -hmm. in our history. And so figuring out how can we solve that problem. Um, I don't know if Republicans won't, will want to do that. They love these issues to be out there like border mm -hmm. security and immigration. Oh, well, they don't want to solve them. They don't want to solve because right. they, they don't run have any policy issues. platforms. They just have they have rage farming and right. if, if they fix the problems they don't have anything to rage farm over yeah here's another thing so i was just in forest lake so my opponent had a session on the wolves mm -hmm. and his intent is to delist the wolf and he managed to divide two groups the mm -hmm. minnesota hunters association and hunters for hunters <laughs> they're like literally fighting at these mm -hmm. hearings which is supposed to be let me listen and figure mm -hmm. out what what is the issue how can we solve it 
they're intentionally making that divisive mm-hmm. and they're going to try to run on this issue. But really, people just want to solve the problem. So I attended. I asked them, what is the problem mm-hmm. and how are you solving it? So Republicans blame and complain, but... Mm-hmm. But They're never in a offer any majority. solutions. No. Well, repeal and replace. How many years did they run on repeal and replace? And it's like, okay, what are you replacing it with? And like, oh, we got, we got nothing. Sorry. I know, and Sorry, they guys. haven't <laughs> done anything. You have Chip Roy. You mm. have Republican members of Congress are saying, I have nothing to run on. We haven't mm-hmm. accomplished anything. And their moderates are all leaving. The Republican mods mm-hmm. are all leaving because yeah. they're so embarrassed by their by their committee, their caucus. Yeah. On one hand, it's I. You know, we see this, and it's like if young people are really fed up with our Congress, and I think they are, it's like, this is the perfect opportunity where it's like, there's a lot wrong. And Mm. there's a lot that we feel like we could change for the better. But on the flip side, there's on the Republican side is the like the moderates who voted against like kicking out the Speaker of the House um, are gone now or are leaving in in numbers that are significant. So it's, on one hand, heartening to see, Mm -hmm. like, there's some like act activism um or grow, m- growing activism but also some like just further moving to the right um with our elected officials on that side so it's yeah, yeah it feels tenuous i it, guess it is especially it is. uh um with the election coming up like it's yeah. it's it feels like an important election it it is an important election. I think it's beyond the feeling part of, of it being an important <laughs> well, yes. election. But they're uh, all important, but this are. one oh, is yes. very important. Right. Mm-hmm. right. You, everyone needs to get involved and volunteer on a campaign. I would love mm. p- if people volunteered on our campaign, and they can do that by going to Jen Schultz for Congress dot com because uh, it's all about grassroots. It's like when Paul Wellstone first ran; mm-hmm. no one thought he could win. Uh, the U.S. Senate race, and he ran a grassroots campaign, and he won. And that's, you know, we're going to replicate that model, too, is just get as many people involved as possible. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Well, that's, that's super exciting. Well, I know uh, Jen was really worried about how long the episode was going to be because she didn't want to talk too much, and I told her it would be about an hour, and we were at an hour and 21 minutes because uh, we... <laughs> We can fill the empty space. We um, pontificate a little bit. We do. Uh, we we wanted uh, to just ask you, um, you know, what are your top three policies? Kind of wrap this up. What are your top three policies going into uh, the party platform on that the party should be platforming in 2024? Obviously, uh, abortion, I think we all agree, should probably be the headline issue. Uh, what What would be your other two? Well, we need to strengthen the middle class and mm-hmm. help working families. So any all the policies that can do that, and that means affordable housing, child care, uh, making sure people can find job opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, education is key. You know, Stauber voted against a bill that would be $6 million for schools in the 8th mm-hmm. District. Um, but well, we need to smart re- people don't vote Republican. <laughs> <laughs> we need we need to strengthen the middle class, and you do that by investing. So my mm-hmm. policy is always, and I truly believe that when we invest in people, we all do better, and that's what spend we money need to, to do. make money, right? So the I platform mean, needs mm-hmm. to be invest in people in our communities, and we will all be better off for it. I yeah. can a hundred percent get behind that. Yeah, our last episode about the American dream was mm-hmm. basically about how instead of investing in things or businesses it's about time we start investing in our people mm-hmm. who run the businesses and do the things and they always statistically have always given us a return on our investment that far exceeds whatever we invest when you invest in education when you invest in healthcare, when you invest in making sure that people have their basic needs met uh it pays back tenfold uh and th- that's the thing is you can't you can't make money by cutting spending like you you never see billionaires putting their their billions under the mattress and being like this this is this is my investment plan you know they they spend money on things um and and that returns that investment that's no different with the country and the country's biggest asset is its people i mean that's that's the whole reason it exists is is for us by us right that's right um so i I, awesome. I believe that. Well, is there anything about your campaign that you want to promote or anything upcoming events or just uh, just kind of anything that you'd like to close this off with? Well, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities, everything from walking in parades with us. We try to go every parade throughout the year, and wow. uh, it's a lot of fun. And and you can dance with Dessa too, <laughs> with me with Dessa. <laughs> and uh, but writing postcards, writing letters to the local paper about um, voting records and Stauber's record, um, door knocking, phone banking, 
Um, we just, we really need the people power. And so yeah. I encourage people to go to my website again, which is jenschultzforcongress.com and just to sign up to volunteer. And if people have money, feel free to contribute whatever you can. Mm -hmm. We have, we have uh, you know, older people on fixed income that are donating like $5 a month and because yeah. they yeah. care so much about this race. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe and that's uh, Jen Schultz with a S C H. I just want to make sure everybody knows. That's yes. the Minnesota way to spell yeah, Schultz. Yeah. <laughs> it's like S C H U L T Z. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they drop the T, but yep. Got it. Got it. Um, well, maybe Jordan and I will make it a volunteer appearance for you. And, uh, absolutely. Some, well, uh, will you be at the uh, the Pine City Parade here uh, for uh, during the fair? It's on our calendar. All right. That's all right. right. <laughs> and we'll be at the fair. So you'll be at yeah. the fair. Yes. All right. Well, I came I... to the fair in 2022 as well. Yep. Uh, I will be a uh, uh, stopping by. What are you? Are you gonna have a booth at the we fair? We will have or? a booth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm gonna stop by. I might not be seeing straight, but I'll, I'll stop <laughs> by and say hi. He, he likes the Pine City. I, uh, I do the fair. Pine City Fair. <laughs> and hopefully, we'll have some meet and greets at the at the local brewery. So we're gonna be doing that. Meeting people it doesn't matter what political party you're in. Mm -hmm. We want to just meet people where they're at and find out what they need. Absolutely. Well. Uh, once again, um, and, and before we, is there any other candidates uh, that you'd really like to throw an endorsement behind if you could, or like other people should be paying attention to um, that, that you would like to make sure that uh, kind of get some attention here if you have the I think, well, since this is young people, I really encourage you, everyone to think about running for office. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter, school board, city council, mayor, uh, state legislative races. We still have open seats in the Minnesota state house races in the 8th district. So if folks are thinking about it, please look, uh, think about running for office. That's really my plug um, because it really will change your life and it can be extremely rewarding. Absolutely. Uh, well, again, thank you so, so much for coming on and going well over our hour time period. I hope you don't feel like you had Sorry. to talk too much. Oh, no, no, no. We love it. We Yeah. We actually prefer like the closer mm -hmm. to an hour and a half because it feels like we can get a, uh -huh. a more into it um, maybe people can just put it on faster yeah one put it on one and a half X, times yeah. one two five yeah. whatever you need to do you know <laughs> hey I, a lot of people up here they commute to the cities it's an hour there an hour back this will get them all the way yeah. there and halfway home you yeah. know uh exactly. no i we we really do appreciate it um again it's it's uh uh it means a lot to me personally that you're running because um i would love to be represented by you i I would fully put my endorsement behind you. I am. Uh, I endorse Jen Schultz if that's a thing I can do. Um, I I uh, am sick and tired of Pete Stauber. He's been just a not great representative, um, to put it very nicely. And uh, I appreciate the amount of effort and work that you're putting into doing this. I appreciate the fact that you're willing to come meet with people like us, uh, sit here and, and waste an hour and a half of your life um, listening to us ramble and 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 chatting with us. Um, so thank you so much for making the trip down from Duluth. And uh, I really hope that uh, you will be our next representative here in 2024. Me too. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you.